mining.com.au and joining me today is the recent addition to the mining.com.au family and that is Data Dan. Now uh, Dan welcome to Expert Insights with mining.com.au. Thank you Shane great to be with you. Now I have got you on today because I noticed the copper price is trading at three and a half month lows and it t- you tell me you have a soft spot for copper. Uh, tell me <laughs> what is Dr. <laughs> well maybe not quite. Uh, tell me what is Dr. Copper telling us about the market right now? Oh, Dr. Copper, yes. Uh, for those who love the history of the old world mineral, uh, Dr. Copper you know, came into popularity as a term uh, because it was really like a diagnosis of uh, how the world economy was trending. And so, and that's probably there is a truism today. Industrial production slowed somewhat. There are concerns over China's housing construction. And so, you know, the price of copper, you know, perhaps moderating or even softening. Uh, is more reflective of you know what we've seen over the last six months that there are concerns that this elevated level of activity we've seen post COVID is now starting to run out of steam and uh, there's probably you know some good and some bad with that because you know like you can't keep going at the pace you have been going because of the inflation concern but copper of course has been you know it's been on a, a red hot run over the, the last wee while and of course that wee while has been you know really the last two to three years as you know, stockpiles have uh, gained pace. And now a lot of countries are looking at, you know, what's next. But again, it, it's a very, very strange geopolitical world we go into and how the, uh, the metals picture fits into that uh, is certainly taking a, a very interesting turn at the moment. So you mentioned copper stockpiles have been increasing in certain mm. parts of the world. And I believe I read an article just recently talking about how smelters in China were going to cut back on copper production. Tell me, what does this tell us overall about the health of the Chinese economy? Because it is the main consumer of copper globally. It is. And certainly it's got uh, the biggest uh, industrial footprint, not just in its export ambition, but also it's in its own domestic manufacturing uh, goals. But in terms of the Chinese economy, there's a couple of things which are going on. Like clearly, state-based banks have moved away from you know, the rather troubled property sector, and there is, you know, a lot of problems within that sector. That you've got some zombie companies, for want of a better description, working. So that's basically they're being kept alive, really, uh, at the behest of the the Chinese government, for want of a better description. So there's the investment uh, pivot, if you like, is into the business lending, but again. So that business lending does also take in you know, copper and you know gold and all sorts of uh, applications in terms of both machinery, storage, you name it. But what does it mean for the Chinese economy? Well, cutting production is not new. Remember, in 2016, the Chinese government implemented a 276-day uh, operating uh, timeline, if you like. That was for coal production. It's simply because they're producing too much of it. In the case of China, their own mining sector is has a lot of inherent inefficiencies. It's very, very rudimentary. And so their problem at the moment is they've got, you know, they're really hemmed in by this very, very tight um, issue around the property market. They've also got a demography challenge now in terms of their medium term aspiration. And they've also got an aging population. And so how do you kind of balance all that out? And so that Chinese economy is really, if you want, growing up. And when you grow up, you, you have a lot of problems. But in terms of cutting production, that's kind of almost symptomatic of the fact that we can't keep producing for the sake of producing. So that cutting production, to me, is a signal that uh, they're simply pairing back to what is realistic in their own uh, uh, near-term focus. So obviously we've got these bold long-term predictions for copper demand and we've got up against the short-term actual demand for copper. Mm. How do you see this playing out? Now, granted, this is a big trend and I might have just asked for a crystal ball, but do you have any sort of um, forecast you'd like to put forward? (laughs) Uh, Is that unfair? (laughs) Oh, possibly unfair. But like the thing is this, you know, forecasting or predicting prices, I mean, it's harder to pick than a broken nose is, is the expression, isn't it? But... Coming back to it, though, I'll, 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 I'll parlay into this. Increasingly, we're seeing mineral demand, not just in, you know, we talk about China then, but increasingly it's taking on a nationalistic fervour based on capability and what people and countries, I should say, want to do within their own backyard. Now, we've spoken about this, Shay, recently. The United States and North America especially 
are now bringing a lot of that industrial production, that manufacturing back home because increasingly, okay, so we want to buy from our own because, you know, we don't trust uh, the way the the geopolitical posturing in Ukraine, in the South China Sea, in the Middle East is all going on. And so these breakouts, these skirmishes, these flashpoints, if you like, they're recasting a conversation which we probably haven't had really since, you know, the, the end of the Second World War. Dan, we've seen copper go on a pretty wild ride over the past couple of months. Uh, you know, it just recently touched over five US dollars per pound. Uh, it's now come back to a little over four US dollars per pound. Tell me, where are we going to see the price movement go from here? So, like, so the cost of copper at the moment's just over four dollars US a pound. That's how they measure it on the London Metals Exchange. Of course, the St Louis Fred uses a, a benchmark of just over nine thousand US dollars per metric ton, although that number has you know, come back to, to below, uh, just at below eight and a half thousand. So in terms of its uh, uh, price guidance, for want of a better description, it's very hard to see it, for example, going up anytime soon. But the thing is, the price is still somewhat eleva- elevated. There's still you know, a fair amount of activity going on. So that range of eight and a half thousand probably seems like the sticking point at the moment per metric ton of copper. But of course, there's the other single problem is that uh, there's just not enough of it. And so uh, you're kind of refining what we've already got. So it's a um, it's definitely wait and see, but without sitting on the fence, I'd say that range at the moment between eight and a half and nine and a half thousand is probably what we have to live with all of us um, in the current time. Uh, listen, Dan, that's a pretty good place to leave today's conversation. Copper's range bound, whether we like it or not. Uh, Data Dan, thanks for jumping on. And I look forward to our weekly conversations going forward. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Shay.